What's up, guys? Spencer Smith, host here of Self Funded with Spencer. Today, my guest is John Beeman of the Elevator Club, and we talk all things metaverse and digital business building. Check it out. All right, so I'm here with John Beeman, right? Yes, sir. Uh, SVP of the Elevator Club. Did I Nailed get it? it? Nailed it. Nailed it. Okay. What is Elevator Club? We're going to answer that question uh, for sure. And I, we met through mutual contact, John Troutman. That's correct. Uh, John has been on my podcast probably only a few episodes ago. And as soon as we got done that day, John Troutman told me he's going to meet John Beeman. And he's like, you've got to meet this guy. And so we, I even reached out, I think, proactively that day and, and said, hey, John, Heard great things about you, and he's like, well, matter of fact, we just talked about you. So here we are, right, doing a podcast a couple months later. So, John, how are you doing, man? And uh, thanks for coming in for oh, the I'm rock I'm doing wall. great. Thanks for having me, man. What is a rock wall commute like? I always wonder. It's about a 45-minute drive with no traffic. Not too bad. You just jump on 30, take the Bush Turnpike or 635, hit the North Tollway, and swing on over here. It's not too terrible as long as you're not on during rush hour. As long as, yeah, because there's, like, one bridge out, right? Is yeah, that my understanding? and it's under construction, so it's a little bit congested between <laughs> 630 a.m. and about 8 a.m. Okay, all right. So I, I got you good. You were here early, Perfect. like 30 minutes early, man, and I really appreciate punctuality. That's really big with me. So kudos to you. So the Elevator Club, I want to describe it and just kind of let's talk about what the subject is, and then I want to go back into your backstory of who Perfect. you are and how did you get here. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. so Elevator, we're basically striving to make it the one-stop shop for SMBs. Uh, we define a small business as fewer than 20 employees. If you look at IRS definitions, they let you go up to 500 employees. Okay. Growing up in a small business environment, I can tell you that's not really 500 small employees business. is not a small business. I get legally either. it can in some cases, but in reality, no, that's not that's not who our target audience is. As we've uh, serviced small businesses, um, I grew up in that environment. I have family members who grew up in the environment. Um, a lot of my work pertains is still um, in that environment. What we've continuously found is that they are excellent at what they do. The bakers are outstanding. The electricians are incredible. The, you know, plumbers, you can go all the way down the line, but they continually dislike and often ignore the back office duties, okay. the bookkeeping, the accounting, the marketing, so on and so forth. So we've been able to package all of that and provide those solutions. However, in the 21st century, 2022, that's not enough. Okay. Um, you've got to continually advance and embrace technology. And that's where the metaverse stuff, um, just some of that digital, digital transformation. transformation. That's a exactly. key word that I really want to ask you what that means because you have a certificate in digital transformation. Earning, or earning, earning, it. earning. You are currently earning. I don't want to overstate your credentials. Not but yet. Not yet. You've got a lot of them. So yeah, tell me about you. Yeah, I know I saw on your, your CV on LinkedIn, you've got a lot of you have a pretty strong educational track record. Thank so you. I'll toot your horn for you. I saw an undergrad and an MBA from Liberty. Yes, sir. And then you have certificates from, from Yale. From Yale, and then currently getting one from Purdue. Okay, and what was the one from Yale? What was What is the one coming from Purdue? So the one from Yale was strategic digital marketing. Okay. Um, I took it during COVID. That was my COVID project. When all okay. the shutdowns happened, obviously I couldn't go out and do this type of thing anymore. Uh, so I was like, well, I've got a little spare time. I'm not really the type to go out and do a garden. <laughs> so I was like, I want to advance my career, but what yeah. can I do? So I started looking around and that uh, came up and did some research on it. Incredible program. Um, one of the best educational decisions I made. Um, it was eight weeks long, but every sentence in the material was immediately applicable to our business then. And we still use a lot of that. You now. said that was digital marketing, strategic, digital, strategic marketing. digital marketing. Okay. And then what is the transformation, the digital transformation? What does that mean? So, I, want a, I want a definition. Of so that. digital transformation is a very broad term. And if you're, it's best to like take an example of it. So for example, if we're like to look at the insurance industry, historically, it'd be a lot of pen and paper, a mm -hmm. lot of wet signatures, oh, yeah. things like that. You can now connect everything so it's all paperless, but that's just step one. With AI and machine learning, you can predict when conditions are going to be arising, when mm -hmm. they'll need different insurance. So underwriting models and things like 100%, that. 100% yeah. automatically sync and connect to your CRM. And then you can connect it to your what's called the Internet of Things. So any device you have connected on your program or platform, depending upon your setup, you can greatly enhance the connectivity, the effectiveness, the efficiency, you're driving down costs, you're increasing productivity, mm -hmm. you're making the uh, customer experience a heck of a lot easier and smoother at the same time. That's digital transformation. So taking us from an analog to a digital world uh, to a degree, but then and then some, right? There's, what is that, the internet 3.0? Is that yep, what they call 3 .0, it? Web 3.0. Web 3.0. 3 so what makes it 3.0? Basically different versions, different iterations, different progressions. That's okay. the oversimplified answer. But is there something big in terms of a transition that you go through to make it that 3.0? It depends who you talk to. Okay. I don't, I'm not 
I'll tell you a funny one personally. I'm not as much into the 3.0 side as digital transformation okay. because 3.0 is a specific silo of digital I transformation. See. I see. Digital transformation includes um, edge computing, XR, which is virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, IoT, things like that. Okay. And I think when you look at those different components and you get the right the right mixture for each specific industry or even business on a micro level – it gets incredibly exciting. Well, you're, I mean, a lot of what you are talking about is somewhat over my head, even though I work in the tech space. I mean, and we have applications with APIs, right? Yep. And we have, you talked about, um, you know, some automation, machine learning, a lot of that's in, in what we do. But I'm on the sales side, right? I under, understand the insurance world. But what I also understand about the insurance world is it is, got a lot of outdated processes and practices. You mentioned wet signatures. Um, we went to some carriers pretty early on and said, well, would you want to go to e-signatures through a DocuSign and have a link? And yeah. the, uh, no, we still want to keep wet signatures. We need to, somebody's good old John Hancock you written have to. on a page and you're like, okay, well, I guess we won't solve that problem just yet until you're ready. Um, but that that's an example, like you said, of digital transformation, right? So in a funny way, another one of those the weird thing with digital transformation is anything is possible. That's the freakiest thing I've learned. Okay. Like our software development, every time we're talking to our software people, we're like, can you make it do this? Can you do this? And every time the answer is, yeah, it's software. We can make it do whatever you want. Yeah. And yeah. it's like really cool, but at the other hand, it's like really creepy. You get this, like some legit good. ethical questions. Yeah. But like in that context with digital transformation, one digital initiative could be you have like a digital signature on an iPad. Okay. So technically it's not a pen. But you could still record that handwritten signature. Right. And so that obviously requires different backend technology, integrations, APIs, and things like that. But that would be one uh, example of a digital transformation. Okay. Well, I like it. That helps me actually put it in proper context. I mean, before we go too far, I do know you are a Texas transplant. Although, you I know, am, you got I the am. Texas pen. Good on you, man. I really appreciate that. But you grew up in Wisconsin, right? That is correct. Born and raised southeast Wisconsin. Uh, grew up in a large family. Seven kids, actually. Really? Um, what, where were you in that order? Of third, right smack dab in the middle. Right in the middle. Okay, yeah, right. exactly. Um, funny story was homeschooled through high school. I okay. uh, moved down to Texas when I was 18, so I was taking my ACT prep and all that stuff. Um, went to Liberty University for college. That's where I got my bachelor's um, business admin economics, got my MBA there. Um, started working for our family business in, I believe it was August of 2013, if okay. I remember correctly. Um, started getting connected to the business community, started off as a junior analyst. What it, by, by the way, family business, what, what is your private family? equity, private, private equity. equity, Beeman capital, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, That's correct. Cool. Beeman capital group. Um, started off as a junior analyst researching oil markets specifically, um, which was really a, like a perfect alignment with my economics um, side. Cause it was yeah. like raw supply and demand. Okay. Um, cool. Really cool. Um, I got a phone call about a year later. Um, boss said, Hey, you know, we've been watching you. Well, we're, we're like, what you doing? But no more oil research. You're going to help us start, build and sell a uh, small contracting company landscaping in two years. Ready, mm -hmm. set, go. I was like, go. Whoa. <laughs> okay, okay. Here boss. we go. <laughs> exactly. Here I go. Uh, we did yeah. it in a year and a half. We got five star rating on home advisor, won their best of 2015 summer award. Um, we successfully sold the business. Uh, then I went back into investment research as senior analyst. Um, and then we started getting into merchant processing, and that um, gave me an opportunity to get ownership into business, and I took that leap. I've um, been very blessed. I uh, started working for a nonprofit uh, startup in August of 2020, and that's when the virtual reality stuff okay. started piquing our interest. Uh, so we were using a program uh, out there for virtual officing, but it was really built for mid to large size companies. Um, you're talking large academic institutions, okay. Fortune 1000 companies, definitely a specific use, but nothing for the SMB. So we were there in like three days. We looked at each other. We were like, we can make this do a whole lot more. So we actually started talking to them, seeing what they could do. Unfortunately, the coding was pretty fixed. Their platform okay. was pretty much set in what they could do. Okay. They didn't build it uh, to be flexible. They knew their customer, they knew their audience, and they built it for that purpose. I see, I see. So there wasn't a whole lot of customization we could do. Didn't have the funding at that time. So we were like, okay, this is outside of a ballpark. We didn't have the software connections to build our own. So we were like, put it on the to-do list in the future, but we're not ready now. Okay. Fast forward to 2021. Uh, actually, later that year, October 2020, first met my now wife. Uh, met on Congrats. A, thank you, thank you, thank you. How did you, you're about to say, you were, how'd you meet? We met on a dating app. So yeah, which one? Hinge. Hinge. All right, we got to get okay, good so job, I'm, Hinge. I'm, you got a you got a, a marriage. That testimonial. Yeah. So I got to give a shout out to my brother here. Uh, he actually helped write my profile. So I was visiting him. So up your brother is responsible. Yeah, for you know, I was like, all right, forever. Oh, you. Well, well, what else would I, I mean? That's what a brother's absolutely, for, right? absolutely. Um, so what is that? What's the 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 shtick with Hinge though? I've, I've I predated to date myself. I predated dating apps. So my wife and I met the good old fashioned way. We ran into each other at college at a party. So what what is him Hinge's like uh, angle? For so Hinge is unique approach was they get you on the app to get you off okay and i was looking for something serious long term um rockwell's 
I love it. It's a great place to raise a family, but it's very much of a high school town. Okay. Um, and Nicole, uh, my wife, was working night shift. So she wasn't meeting anyone either. True. So we're like, happy. we were looking for the right the things. We were looking for the right reasons. We wanted something long term. Uh, profiles matched, started chatting, went out for a date, but, uh, date at Top Golf. Uh, we opened up the menu, and, we, and she goes, Ooh, chocolate cake. I'm like, Yeah. Oh, uh, speaking still to my, my soul. beating heart. Speaking right? to yeah, my yeah, soul. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and as they say, the rest is history. That's awesome. Well, congratulations. So thank you guys you, are you. still in new, newlyweds, newlyweds, right? yeah, yeah. newlyweds. Awesome, man. This podcast is brought to you by True Captive Insurance, a premier medical stop loss captive for employer groups ranging from 25 to 1,000 employees. True Captive believes in healthcare that is personal and insurance that isn't complicated. That's why they take a white glove approach, making it easy for employer groups to transition into a program built specifically for them. Check them out at True Captive. Dot com. And I always like to hear dating app success stories because they get a lot of, you know, uh, negative press because of, oh, their hookup apps and stuff like that. But there is still yep. the ability. And have you seen that chart where it showed the way people have met their spouses over time? It's like a histor- historical way. It's like, you know, either in school, on the job, high school sweethearts, things like that. And then you see, like, all of a sudden, here comes dating apps. And now it's this hockey stick really? where okay. essentially I think about 40% of all marriages start nowadays from a dating app. I and mean, it's still going up like that. Yeah. It's, a, it's a new way to meet people. I was one of the people early on. I trash talked it like heck. Yeah. And I'm like, man, I really have to eat crow on it. But well, hey, see, back in my me. day, we were just getting Facebook on my campus. And that was the origins of the dating app, I think, because it's like, oh, you can message girls. And and that's, I think, how actually Facebook started before it became, you know, met, yep. what is it I'll, called? Meta today? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So let's go back to the elevator club because yes. that's, that's what we're here for. Um, and you said you gave me a little bit of the focus of elevator club, small, medium sized businesses. You're helping turn them into viable, sustainable, businesses, right? sustainable profitable yeah. businesses. Um, the vast majority of businesses go under um, in the first couple of years. Very few of them make it past year five. What is that percentage? That, do you have the number that it actually goes under? Is it 90 something? Well, or? 80% don't make it to year 15. Okay. And then only 50% make it to year five. Okay. Wow. And a lot of it goes back to the same reasons. They're undercapitalized. They don't have a business plan. All these basic structural things. Okay. And so that was the purpose of the nonprofit to bring, hey, we're going to teach you how to write a business plan, SOPs, a marketing plan, a budget, things like that. However, when we started getting into virtual reality and used it for our internal officing, it opened our eyes and we were like, okay, this is technology that's still new. The SMB can be on the front end of it. As we did more research, we found it's following literally the exact same pattern as websites and social media. So the websites in the early 90s, social media 12, 15 years ago, metaverses are following the exact same patterns. Right. So we firmly believe they're going to be uh, mass adopted within the next... Anywhere between three and seven years. Okay. Um, a funny statistic, there are already 57 million VR hardware sets in the U.S. currently being used. That's my, uh, Facebook Oculus. That's the Microsoft Vive. 57 million? 57 wow. million. That's one of those things that snuck up on us. We're I like, said that's Whoa. a lot more than I thought. I still, See, my perception, I've never been an early adopter of technology, so my perception is that was a little bit fringe, a lot of for the gamers, right, things like that. But 57 million, that's what, one, one seventh of the, the yeah, population? Yeah, no small the chunk. Yeah, no yeah. small chunk at all. Um, and a lot of innovation over the last. This is part of the whole digital transformation interest, a lot of the innovations we're seeing are coming from the gaming industry. Okay. So like even the like the Fortnites, the Call of Duties, uh, Minecraft, things like that, companies are watching what they're doing, why they take off, the technology mm-hmm. behind it. Um, and that gets into other metaverses, uh, Verbella, Decentraland, obviously uh, Facebook slash Meta. Um, but no, anyway, rewinding back to Elever, um, that was really what we saw as a um, – a tool for small businesses to use. That being said, we're n- our metaverse isn't a simple platform we're building. Uh, okay. there, are, there are enough platforms out there. Snapchat's got a VR platform. Obviously, Facebook Meta, Microsoft. I mean, you go all the way down the list. If you're building just another platform, you're kind of one in the crowd. There's really nothing to differentiate. Okay. It. It's almost the equivalent of creating other social media platform. It's okay. like, well, that that's cool, but... W- why? What's the well, difference? Can I ask some dumb questions? No, no, I'm there's not, no dumb questions. I know. Well, I'm, they might be dumb, but you never know. Um, so Metaverse, when you talk about a platform, these platforms don't intersect with each other, right? They're, they're, are they not siloed? Not yet. Okay. So there was a fascinating article written by Deloitte, um, and they mentioned four possible outcomes of the Metaverse. Um, two of them were like utter bust. You know, One okay. was like half bust. One was success, but widely fragmented. And then the other one was success, and you only have one or two players like um, Apple and Microsoft. Okay. That would be the equivalent. The jury still remains out on that which way we go. We firmly believe it's going to be one of those top two, though, where it takes off, becomes widely adopted. 
it's looking like right now it's going to be mass fragmented, in my opinion. Okay. Okay. Um, the rationale is you create them for specific purposes. I see. So like Facebook Meta is building there all for that social engagement, whereas like Adidas is building theirs for trying on shoes before you buy them. Mm -hmm. And you can. But it almost sounds like going in onto a cable. You got a cable box and you pick what channel you want to plug into. To, this is me an outside perspective. That's what it sounds like to, to a me. degree. Okay. To a degree, and that plays into some of our uh, conversations upcoming about virtual real estate and such. You need to know what you're looking to accomplish. You okay. have to set that end goal and then work back because there are some situations where. For small business, Metaverse will only be an ad platform like Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. For others, if you're a web designer with 15 team members, yeah, you're going to be a lot more embedded in it because now you're going to have virtual officing. You're going to mm -hmm. have document sharing and all this other stuff. Um, so it very much depends upon the situation and what you're looking for. Well, I would say the virtual officing is the one that I, I, I for me, as a, again, I'm not a, like on the bleeding edge of technology adoption. I'm going, actually, I can see an application for that because in the world post COVID, I'm a sales guy. I used to go and yep. meet people in person. Then we all shifted over to Zoom. There's probably going to be a little bit of a boomerang, in my opinion, where people want to go back more like we're doing right here. Absolutely. However, if I'm looking at, well, if I know I'll be on 12 Zooms a day, but I could also maybe feel like I'm a little bit more in, in virtually in the same room as that other person rather than a screen solely and it's two-dimensional two – that, for me, does sound like it might have a, a good, strong use case for mass adoption. That's what we're seeing internally, and that's everything that we're seeing externally as well. Because Zoom fatigue is very much a real thing. Yeah. I mean, just a standard yes. video conference, I can only do so much of it. But when you have that fully immersive technology, you feel like you're there. And that's where you get into some of the fun debates. Do you want more like an augmented mixed reality or do you want like the full replacement virtual reality? Like the haptic feedback suits and things like that. I've exactly. seen the gloves where you touch something and it makes it, you know, makes it feel like you're touching a, a, yeah. an apple or something. Or like, um, have you seen Snapchat's platform? No, I've never used Snapchat. Have you so. seen uh, the movie Free Guy? Free, yes, yeah, yeah. That technology is actually not far-fetched. Okay, really, really? So that's what Snapchat's working on. And so again, it's like you, wild, man. And that's the key to metaverses. Okay. If they strive to replace human interaction, they're gone. Okay, so you think it's to facilitate, facilitate, enhance, and supplement what you already have. Okay, okay. that's the key. Well, and that's what I would say. I would agree with you because I don't want replacement of human oh, heck interaction. No. That's dystopian, in my opinion. That's what. The, what's that Wally where they're all floating around on the chairs and plugged in? You know that that I don't want that. You'll, happen, right? We as human beings are created to have that type of connectivity. Yeah, you, you can't replace that. And even though you have a higher level of connectivity connectivity in VR than you do like on a video conference, it's still different than actually shaking someone's hand. I totally, totally agree. Right, and, that, and that's what when I go back to when I think there'll be a boomerang. I know me as a salesperson, and I know my ex, my perception is not you know, unique to me, shaking a hand, you oh, know, yeah, sitting sure. knee to knee, let's have a cup of coffee. Let's sit around a table for 15 minutes and just get to know each other. Well, we don't feel like today when I have meetings, boom, 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 boom. I'm like, I guess I got to go to the bathroom real quick. Let me come back as I'm hopping onto the second meeting. Yep. Whereas if we're sitting in person, there's a little bit more of a casual nature to our interaction and you don't feel so rushed to get and uh, that's where a meeting it, in. If you, if the VR slash metaverse technology enhances or supplements the physical reality that's something that can really sing as we like to say internally yeah um i'll give you an example if you're looking to try a new networking group out in rockwall well you know you'll you're interested but that's an hour and a half driving plus mm -hmm. plus you're one hour there plus you probably have to get food or something one hour networking turns into a half a day mm -hmm. with metaverse technology you can sample that for truly one hour. Okay. That would then determine, okay, this is something I want to commit to. Mm -hmm. uh, or mm -hmm. you might find synergies with people where, obviously, you know, in Frisco, you might find synergies with people in New York City. Well, rather than having to fly up every month, yeah, yeah jump into a virtual office and you can have the same relationship building. Well, there's a lot of the thought. I've already put the, the map, the, the video out. I want to make a video about virtual versus in-person sales and the pros and cons because there absolutely are 100%. pros and cons of each. And I, when I look at the pros of virtual, the efficiencies of how many meetings you can have, you and like you said, that. no logistics other than can you get Wi-Fi access, Literally. right? And then there is the ability to have uh, quite a few more interactions in a day. So from a, an expense standpoint, clearly less expensive than traveling. Substantially. Um, then the, the other the, the downsides of that we just talked about where you don't get uh, human interaction, nonverbal communication, you know, the Which depths I, of relationships. I know you, I know I'm just saying like, no, I'm, I'm fleshing this out because I'm trying to convince myself one or the other is better. And I'm not sure yet. It's not better. It's both. Both. Okay. That's the key because we've already had interest in our software, which isn't um, ready for rollout yet. We've got it built in. It's usable, but we want to clean up some things, you know, make it pristine. Okay. Um, 
we've already gotten a lot of interest for licensing it and white labeling it. I believe well, it. For a lot of conferences. Because, you know, one of the things we'll have is like a big auditorium. And we've already had, I think, three or four large groups say, hey, when is that ready? When can we actually hold it? Rather than flying our team of 500 out to Las Vegas, it'll cost us about 1% of that just to have it in yours. So sure, what sure. does that look like? So then l tell me about that. So some all the people that would be attending the conference had a, a virtual reality headset? If correct? they want it. If they want If they want That's the other. This is okay. where the technology gets uh, right. fascinating. You can have uh, different iterations. You can be in the mm. same software in the same digital space but on different platforms. Okay. So like for our networking right now, you can be on an uh, he Oculus headset, you can be on a desktop, or you can jump in on your phone. Oh, really? This podcast is sponsored by PlanSight. PlanSight is a technology for employee benefits brokers to more efficiently manage their RFP process for any group size, all funding types, and over 20 benefit lines and point solutions. PlanSight is the only end-to-end -end RFP technology on the market today. Let's modernize your RFP process together. Check us out at plansite.com. So, but the, obviously then there's layers of how immersion. De immersion. That's yeah, the term that yeah. we like to use, yeah. that immersive experience changes. If you're on your phone, it's not real immersive. You mm -hmm. can talk, you can hear. Computers just step up. It's a little bit better. You I mean, you see the virtual reality cleaner. Mm -hmm. You get a bit better view. So it's better, mm -hmm. but then that VR platform is going to be best. That's when like literally you're looking around and you see this virtual room and it, feel like you're in the middle of an entirely different room i mean we rotate between like a beach setting and like a mountain setting and things like that but you literally feel like you're there well and then we talked about the haptic feedback which is another layer of immersion do you think it ever gets and this is probably a difficult question to answer it ever gets imperceptible from actual reality the technology, the technology itself exists for okay. that it's not affordable okay, okay <laughs> but the, te no, the technology exists and they're testing it they already have um, prototypes on it. So, so yeah, we will be in the there. matrix at some day. Uh, not inherently. There's, there's a difference between having the technological ability to do so. And this is where the strategic marketing comes into play and the consumer adoptability. Yeah. If they're not going to adopt the technology, it doesn't matter what it does. Yeah. It has to enhance their experience. It has to help them solve a problem. All these basic marketing questions, mm -hmm. but the, the shift that we've seen in marketing, it's not so much about solving a problem as much as it is enhancing the experience. Okay. Okay. Different way of thinking about marketing. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So let's talk about a use case then. So maybe an example of where the Elevator Club really helps a particular type of business, or maybe give me some pragmatic applications of this for a, for a business. So I'll go through um, a contracting business because okay. I got a little experience there. It speaks to my soul. Um, you immediately look at it and say, I don't need, you know, Metaverse. I'm a landscaper or I'm a plumber. I can't use that. No, but if you look at your business as a whole, you need to have the key elements of structure. You mm -hmm. need to have your business plan, your SOPs, your marketing, your budget. 80, 85% of businesses don't have three of those things. Okay. And so that's like step one. Go ahead and get this stuff implemented. We'll show you how to do it. We have a course all prepped lined up for you. Once you have, have that platform built, then you can literally calculate what your time's worth and say, I'm more effective and more efficient at running my numbers. I can do that. Or I'm going to hire a bookkeeper or I'm going to hire a marketing firm or I'm going to hire whatever it might be. Then you're outsourcing all the back office responsibilities rather than neglecting them because neglecting them isn't an option. That's what leads to that high failure rate. Okay. So at that point, that's the immediate tangible benefit right there. When you get into VR, you have to build relationships. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are, what industry you're in. You're in. You have to continuously build new relationships and sustain old ones. VR technology allows you to build more, sustain more. And then on top of that, where we're going, hope to be there in six months, knock on wood, actually renting out virtual office space. So the ah. idea would be rather than actually having a huge facility and only one or two trucks to house, you know, 20 employees, you could cut that facility by 60, 70%, have your vehicles there, have yourself a little bit of inventory, but then a lot of your staff could be working remotely. Which okay. We're seeing, again, the need for hybrid work settings, or if you're like a web designer, a web builder, like we were talking earlier, mm -hmm. you have that team of 15 people, you have some in California, maybe you have one in Oregon, maybe uh, in Florida, and a couple in Texas scattered throughout the country. Well, rather than having to jump on a, on a Zoom call, it's real choppy. It's a very choppy experience. Let me create a link. Let me send you this. You literally just naturally congregate in a virtual room. Interesting. Not so does, do you still have the inherent limitations of the streaming, the, the bandwidth of uh, like your Wi-Fi when you're in a you virtual You are subject world? to okay. internet. Is <laughs> it, are the demands even greater in a virtual environment? Mm, I wouldn't say so. I okay. mean, if you've got one or two bars, 
your phone starts to get finicky, your virtual reality is going to get finicky too. Okay, okay, okay. But it doesn't have that uh, huge increase in demand. Really not. Um, okay. It depends more on the application from a hardware side. Okay. That's the tricky part. So VR headsets, most can't go more than an hour and a half, two hours without a charge. Really? Okay. So like right now, you're limited to an hour of networking or something mm -hmm. like that. You can leave your computer app open for a longer period of time, but this is something we saw in the past with other programs. Your computer will literally get hot. Yeah, it's a data hog. It's, it takes up a lot of computing power, um, so those are some of the, like the I would call higher initiatives from a large industry perspective. Things that they're working. Well, on. I would think it actually might even be a good thing that there's limitations of the the hardware and the headsets itself, right? So, hey, my kid won't get out of the virtual reality. Well, his headset died, so thank goodness he's got to plug unplug for a minute. There's right? still some work to do on the uh, headset side. So I'll give you a funny statistic. Almost, I think it's forty three, forty five percent of people suffer from motion sickness. I believe that. And I had it too. So uh, in some apps, you jump around from like spot to spot. In other apps, you're stationary. But in some apps, you can move with the joysticks, on the, especially in like uh, the Oculus platform. Okay. Even just walking around, there are a few situations where I was like, oh, I'm getting a little queasy here. Yeah, yeah. So part of our customer experience, it needs to be short distances for moving until you work people up to the point where they're used to working it. So keep hallways short. Don't let rooms get too big, uh -huh. yet still have enough room to have, you know, 40, 50 mm -hmm. people in the same room. So does Oculus also sell, like, an Oculus-branded, like, puke bucket in Kate for people that... Not they, that I found yet. Not okay, that I found I yet. Say, that might be a good... I would definitely get... I, roller coasters. You remember those old-school... Um, Vir they were kind of virtual reality yep, simulators I where do. you felt like you're on a roller. Man, I would get sick on those things. That well, obviously that's a really aggressive form of motion sickness. This is a little, probably a little bit less substantial, but still, I could imagine if you're bouncing around and it feels like it to your body that it make you sick. It happens in varying degrees to different people based on their own unique circumstances. And so that's one of the major improvements that needs to take place before it's that like we're talking that wide mass adoption, mm -hmm. mass usage. That's just one of the. Um, barriers i would say that we need to need to fix you can't have 40 percent of your people <laughs> get yeah. ready to puke yeah, yeah like i can't follow what you're saying about this insurance product man i'm gonna throw up um so what about though do you have like your own avatar i guess right or yeah like, you create your own avatar you create your own avatar okay that is a developing technology you can make it extremely high quality to the point where it's literally looking exactly like you are you're talking okay. high level graphics the difficulty well one of the difficulties is obviously cost to build it but the number two is data consumption data consumption okay because you're consuming and using a lot of data on a program and then what is it what does it require if i'm i'm using like a you know, this um, auditorium you guys have built or this virtual metaverse for me to have a virtual office what, is, what does it require to maintain something like that? Once it's built, is the infrastructure, the digital infrastructure kind of built and sustainable or is there a continued maintenance? I mean, like I have Internally no, no, for yeah. us, as it's our software, yeah. we would definitely have maintenance okay. things. I mean, at that point, you're taking into, taking into account cybersecurity things. Yes. Because yes, you yes. need to watch, obviously, privacy. You need to watch data. You, need, you don't want people who aren't authorized to, to get in to get in. Um, so internally, we would have a lot on our plate, but the user has nothing to worry about. I mean, it's not like you have to to scrub a desk dust mm. it or anything when it's not like you have to worry about oh i need to call a plumber because my toilet's broken right? doesn't exactly work that way yeah it doesn't doesn't want to work that way and that's the one thing i did want to talk about with you and i know we had lunch a couple months ago and the subject came up is the subject of digital real estate i need this to be explained to me the utility of owning digital real estate you hit the nail on the head utility yeah. you have to know what you're trying to do with it because okay. there are uh, virtual real estate platforms out there kind of like cryptocurrency okay. um, in my opinion if you're doing it just for the investment side it's a gamble okay now if you like gambling and you're good at it i'm not going to tell you not to do it mm -hmm. but for me i don't like gambling <laughs> yeah i'm not a big gambler. I, I hate to lose more than i love to win <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but in terms of the utility of it that's why we're doing what we're doing by creating our own um, VR platform. Most platforms out there have very limited utility for the SMB. For a mid to large size company, you're talking conferences, you're talking office sharing, you're talking okay. team collaboration. In some cases, you're talking software design, user interface design, okay. um, architecture, all the way down the line. Um, for the SMB, that isn't in the affordable range yet. It's okay. not at a specific use case for them. That's why we're entering the market because we know the business functions they need help on. So we can fill those from a service side, but then we can also build it into an AI program okay. where we can automatically help cut this, you know, learning curve in half, so to speak. So then from an investment standpoint, like you said, it's speculative. 100% speculative. But if you're using that real estate for a purpose, then do you, do you, oh, you own that digital the, real you estate? You can. Okay. You can. So the theory is like in the physical world, you don't think of it any differently. You would buy it and develop it. Okay. So that's like a uh, Decentraland would be an equivalent, I would say. They sell virtual real estate and you 
code your own building. You code your own storefront. Whatever it is okay. you want to do. It's a um, decentralized platform, hence the name decentralized. But if I code my own building, and I, let's say I built a house. Yeah. The other people on the platform now see that my house is built yep. in this. Okay. So it's just like I'm driving down the street and somebody builds a house, if you will. So you all, in a decentralized way, get to build your own houses? I mean, are there Depending building? upon okay. the, the software okay. setup. Okay. So for ours, we're not looking to have that. Um, same level of open coding because we're not building it for the developer. Yeah, we're building it for the SMB. Okay. So yes, there'll be a certain degree of customization. But they come to you because you you know how to do it, right? They don't know how to do it. Exactly. Okay. They're they're not coming to us to say, I want you to build me a virtual building. Yeah. They're coming because look, I know I got a gap in my business. I don't know what it is, or I know what my problem is, or it's I want to get to the next age of technology. How do I do that? Mm -hmm. This is how you start embracing it. This tees you up. And then the idea is when they're comfortable with ours they're going to be comfortable to go into whatever platform they need to. Okay. Because, every, again, every business is going to have different needs. We're going to be there with them throughout the entire business life cycle because they'll need support and assistance on the management side. When they're talking just marketing, mm -hmm. yeah, of course they'll be able to do marketing in ours. But they'll also, just like you have multiple marketing channels for your marketing plan, they'll be in other metaverses too. Well, and I see this. I definitely see the application. You mentioned marketing, but even sales as well. You mentioned Adidas before. The feeling of, oh, I can try on a pair of shoes virtually before mm -hmm. I order them online. That makes sense to me, right? 100%. Because if you're buying a product and you kind of want to have a sense of what it looks like on your feet or feels like, I mean, obviously they can't, if they're not using any haptic feedback, I don't feel them on my right. feet, but I can see them in the mirror, right? Exactly. I see them with my jeans or whatever the case may be. That that makes a lot of sense. If you're selling a tangible product, but it has to, most often it's being done over the internet or transacted over the internet. Correct. Right. Correct. Okay. That makes sense. And I, I could totally see that. And I'm not a skeptic by any means. I just always worry about like, as we, Go too far in one direction. What are the downstream or the unintended consequences of doing so from a physical world or human, you know, flourishing you know, standpoint? You're talking human things. well-being. I yes, mean, it's like one yeah. of those weird things. Hypothetically, does this go to like that weird matrix thing where it's, yeah, you're living life and there's this weird, different virtual set. If you let yourself get out of control, you can, just mm -hmm. like Facebook. There are people who are literally addicted to social media and of they course. spend six, ten hours a day on it. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you can do that to VR too, but if you can have discipline and control over yourself and you know how to leverage it and why you're using it, then it becomes a really helpful tool. Yeah, I mean, like anything human beings do, every there's a spectrum of benefit to detriment to yourself, yeah. right? And you as a human being have to either be able to control it or if I'm a parent, be able to guide my children to control it properly. But everything has that spectrum of utility to, oh, it's going to ruin my life and you just need to help be able to manage that fluid exactly spectrum. which all goes back to that big question what's the why what are you trying to accomplish if yeah. it's increasing sales only well assuming everything else is intact perfectly it might just be a simple ad campaign you might have a virtual storefront for some digital foot traffic if it's to enter a new space where you really have no idea what's going on that's a really good partnership for us because we're going to walk you through here things you need to watch out for here's the structure you need to have in your business okay. here's what you need to outsource here's what you do to embrace this technology here's how you enhance your customer's experience here's how you can transform internal operations and it goes all the way down the line okay so then two other things that i think are related to this that you might be able to educate me on uh blockchain technology right is that is that too far out of your wheelhouse or do you yeah i can talk about it i'm not an expert well, I, mean, on it, I don't want I you to explain it necessarily like, what is blockchain more what would be an application or a use case for blockchain technology and what you do so ultimately where it would go is would be a token okay because it makes a lot of sense for us to have a token rather than just do everything on a credit card for example okay so that would be one application you have a blockchain uh, to ensure the ledgers you know that makes a lot of sense. We're on a mission to partner with the most innovative companies in America to fix health benefits one plan at a time. NavMD has created a blueprint that delivers world-class benefits to 155 million Americans. Better benefits starts with data intelligence. Our platform is empowering the next generation of advisors to zero in on opportunities to optimize the plan, build the right team, implement proven strategies and solutions. Join us on our journey to revolutionize health benefits. Let NavMD put you a step ahead. When a token, uh, my, a funny, a really serendipitous, my father two days ago called me about talking about tokens and he was, uh, he was kind of, I don't know, he was looking at an investment video or something like that. And he's like, I think these tokens make sense. So when you say a token, describe to me, how does that differ from a coin, right? Like a, like a Bitcoin or something? Hypothetically, like it's very, very similar. Okay. The, the, the difference is it would be our token that we use for our world. Okay. 
So you have your elevator tokens. Literally. If you will. Yeah. So no di- no difference in going into like a uh, a modern version of an arcade and you swipe your credit card 100%. for the tokens. Okay. Okay. So that that token is just a way to exchange value, but it's only use is within whatever Correct. metaverse or world you're, Correct. you're exchanging yeah, that, those Correct, yeah, that's where we would have it because then we can also verify and validate the financial transactions. You're reducing fraud. You're also improving the security on it. Okay. At the same time, you're cutting costs. So when like, I say is okay, it less is speculative cool. than an investment style? You're not using it for an investment. Yeah. That's the key differentiator. Yeah. Yeah. The cryptocurrency as an investment is a totally different discussion. Okay. The token that's locked within a world, so to speak, that's just like, almost like a barter system. It's got a, it's but just, it's got it's a predictable a exchange rate and things exactly. like that. So you know exactly. You're basing what it you're on. So hypothetically, in that example, it would be based on like the U.S. dollar. Okay. And one dollar, you know, worth one this or whatever. You one just token. do it to, you know, or a hundred tokens or whatever. Okay. Yeah. That, well, that makes sense, right? Because like then, Fortnite. Think of it like yeah. Fortnite, where you buy your V Bucks or Call of Duty. You buy your tokens. It, same. You're concept. just converting it into be able to use that currency in whatever digital application itself, and then you can, mm-hmm. I guess, reconvert it back to hard money if you needed to. Hypothetically. Hypothetically, okay. So the other two of that question then is the NFT space. Do you guys do anything around NFTs? Inevitably, we're heading in that direction. Okay. Uh, that non-fungible tokens is yeah. basically a way of preserving uh, and validating and protecting a digital asset. Okay. So as you get into virtual real estate, you get into virtual digital assets, you need a way to protect it. NFTs provide a great way to do that. Okay, cool. So, and then this, this is, I'm sorry, I'm stretching you a little bit and you know, I didn't prepare you for that. But as you were talking about all these things, I'm like, this is all a world that's so new to me. I feel like the old guy in the room, you know, like too, like, what is this NFT thing? But I, I want to understand it because not because I'm some sort of speculative investor that wants to make a ton of money flipping NFTs, but tell me why it actually works, right? That, those are the things like, if you can convince me that there is a utility, like you said earlier, an application for this thing, I go, okay, well, maybe in that particular example, I could see that. Think one. of it yeah. like a painting. Okay. If you had like Picasso create an NFT, well, how do you know it's like the original painting? Yeah. An NFT, you can prove that. You can prove And it. so there's your digital protection. There's your, almost like your intellectual property protection, mm-hmm. so to speak. You you can show and prove that is the one. So I think it was uh, Jack Dorsey uh, put his first ever tweet on an NFT. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he sold it for like a couple million bucks or something funny. The difficulty and ethical dilemma you have to watch in that with our current technology, there's nothing stopping him from creating another one. Yes. And so it's like, okay, so then what's the, your point? What's the utility? It's still being figured out. The mm. technology behind it is really cool, and you can see where it goes from an opportunistic standpoint. Mm. In terms of right now, you got to go back to your business plan and be like, okay, what am I really trying to accomplish, mm-hmm. and does an NFT fit within that realm? If it doesn't, don't adopt my recommendation. Don't adopt a new tactic just because. Okay. Unless it's like an R and D thing, then by all means you got to go through the research and see see where it goes. But don't do NFTs just for the sake of for having the trend. An NFT. Yeah, don't, yeah. It's like wearing Crocs. Well, one on really Crocs. good example that I talked to somebody uh, the other day about this, and she brought this up to me because she's in the NFT space. Um, she said that one application that does make sense is I'm an author. I write a book. Hundred percent. If I write a book, somebody creates a, a physical copy of that book. I sell it once. The bookstore that gets it as a used bookstore gets to turn around and buy it and sell it again and again and again. But if I'm an author, I get paid once. If I have a digital version of that, every time it transacts, theoretically, I could make money again, almost like a royalty on a TV show Correct. or something of that effect. That There's one of those uh, aha moments for And me. that's one of the, again, the, the technology behind it is really cool. There's still a few key variables within that. But yeah, that's, the, that, that's one example of the utility. Well, very cool. And the other thing I was going to say is, uh, you know, being that outdated or, you know, being a little bit of a curmudgeon about technology to a degree. I remember my friend um, very early had with the original Blackberries that you scroll yep. through and he had internet on his phone and he was checking like ESPN scores. I'm like, why would you want internet on your phone, dude? That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. And then obviously I was clearly completely wrong about that. So I think there's probably a lot of people out there like me that have a, a healthy dose of skepticism. But this happens, like you said, of every wave of technology. It happened with the internet. It happened with, yeah, what are some other examples you said of the phase? Social media. Social media, yeah. So uh, there will always be some people that manipulate or take advantage of oh, a for, new wave sure. and get rich quick and it's a scam. Yep. But out the outcome of that is there ends up becoming 
the the actual iteration of it that it, it was going to work. Correct. Right? Um, so we're going through that. What does that cycle look like to you in terms of that mass adoption of the metaverse? Like how long is a typical life cycle of a new technology like that? It really varies. I mean, we're okay. still trying to figure that out, to be honest. I mean, that's like one of the million dollar questions. Is this like a five year flash or is it a 15 year pattern? Yeah. Or is this like a new cultural change where we're going to go down this road and becomes a part of our everyday life and our kids and our grandkids are doing the exact same thing? I, I think we will, man. I really do. And even though I kind of weigh in the pros and cons of virtual versus in-person sales, I do think there will all, Zoom isn't going anywhere. Virtual technology yeah. is here to stay. Yeah. There's no question about that. The question is how inundated do we as a mm -hmm. culture and mm -hmm. society become, and I'll say this carefully, in it. In it. Yeah. When I would say for me, and I try to communicate this to my wife um, when I come home, it's like if I had 11 meetings that day and I conducted all 11, like I'm the one having to talk. I am mentally exhausted. And you don't realize that Zoom fatigue that you talked about, especially if you're a presenter. I mean, I am so worn out mentally that I almost can't yeah, formulate you're, words you're anymore. My brain is done until tomorrow. Um, and that's not fair to her because I've got to communicate with her and the, the relationship side yep. that I know you, you newlyweds are getting to go Absolutely. through right now. But that's a real thing. Um, but, and in somebody that doesn't spend all day on Zoom doesn't quite understand. But that's also, again, rethinking our assumptions. Mm -hmm. We're assuming you have to have that many in a day or right. that you even have to have that eight to 10 hour work day. That's very there true. Are, there are very, there are a number of days where you can get the exact, like with virtual technology, the exact same amount of work done in four or six hours. Totally. I can remember going on uh, commutes here from Dallas to Oklahoma. Yeah. I, and I have four meetings in that one day and go, man, that was a good day. That was a jam packed day. Cause I had the logistics and driving. Yep. If I have four meetings, I could have four meetings in two hours. Exactly. Right? Does I, I did the same amount of work, way more efficient, but like you 100%. said, uh, you know, rethinking the notion of, hey, it has to be an eight-hour day. I, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's a really strong four-hour day, and I'm still just as productive, if not more productive. Which goes back to that, that, that metric, that KPI or productivity or whatever number you're watching. Almost in every industry, you can point to a specific number and say, that's what I have to do every day. Mm -hmm. If I do that, we're fine. If I don't, we're going to slow. Yeah. <laughs> and if you hit the number, it doesn't really matter if you hit it in two hours or 10 hours. Well, it's a four it's hour work week that Tim Ferriss talks about too. It, there's a I, lot of validity yeah. behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and this is, this is a way for that actually to be a reality for a lot more people. For sure. Right, right. For sure. All right. Well, so I know we've been, we're talking about the future, but I do want to talk the future specifically of the Elevator Club. Yes. So you were talking about people are waiting for you to get this technology out and they're chomping at the bit to, to, to be able to use your, your auditoriums and things like that. What are some continuing uh, evolutions of what you guys are doing? In the next couple of years, so that you can share if you don't want to share. I can okay. share a little bit. Some okay. things I can't, but I can share a little bit. Okay. Uh, it's a three phase launch. Now, uh, phase one is very much of this country club networking theme. Phase two is an expansion of that into virtual buildings. And then phase three is when you have the full blown digital city, so to speak. Um, okay. and, and digital city is a funny term because this is built for a B2B small business environment. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. isn't something that. Um, replaces or competes with a Snapchat or Facebook meta. Everything that takes place within this VR is designed to help that SMB sustain their business and profit okay. from it. Well, and so you, you mentioned, I want to go back to one more thing before I have you kind of wrap up your closing thoughts here. You th you think that out of those four possibilities, what was the study that was done? So you'd have total bust, yeah. half bust, you know, then both fragmentation, are, the fragmentation or like the one or two dominant. So why players. do you believe the fragmentation is the most likely? I'm you can curious. specialize it. Okay. Um, that's the, the key. You can create very specific uses with uh, VR technology. And I, I see a lot of validity going down that direction. But so if I'm, if I'm a user, right, and I'm in an Oculus, and if there are these siloed locations or metaverses that I jump into, what is the process of jumping out of one and jumping into another? Is that pretty Think seamless? Think of it like an app. Okay. You would jump into an Adidas app, then you might jump into the Elevator Club app in the future and be like, hey, let me quick fix up my business or check my okay. metrics or whatever it might be. So my, my, I, I drilled too far down when I was thinking about like cable and different channels. It's more like my smart TV when I go from Netflix to Amazon. As of now, that's where it okay. is. Where I think it makes a lot of sense to keep that direction for the next two, three years at least. We'll see if there are any innovations, but that's what we're planning on. Well, then, or yeah, I guess maybe the, the cool thing would be if I could go from a I could teleport, right? I just pop in a teleport and go from one to the other. I don't know, man. I'm being I'm being silly now, but this is no, it's also true. because it's stretching my brain since I've never experienced it firsthand. But it's almost like there's a curiosity because I, oh, yeah. I you know, I do want to see if this actually would work. The, 
and for what purpose? Yeah, for and what that, purpose? Yeah, yeah. That's the, the, that's I just the need a purpose. Function. That's all I need. It needs to have that pragmatic function. Yeah. And so, all right. So, closing thoughts. Uh, and I appreciate you, John. This is yeah, actually coming, it actually even morphed you know into something even more interesting than I thought it would be, and it mm-hmm. already is going to be interesting conversation. So, I think this will be a fun one to go watch back. But kind of closing thoughts as as we've had this what forty five or so minute yeah. discussion. Yeah. Leave it. Leave it. Whatever you want to say, man, and then we'll get wrapped up and go to lunch. You you got to embrace technology. I mean, even though it's uncomfortable to accept something new. <laughs> And something that's always going to be changing. We're in that technological digital age. You don't fight it. Um, there have been a number of cases where we've tried to fight things in the past, fighting the internet, fighting websites, mm-hmm. fighting social media. It's common use now. It's yeah. the same thing for the SMB. This technology is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. Embrace it. Figure out if and how you can use it for your small business, mm-hmm. or e- even if it, you're a, a sales rep or a mega company or whatever. Embrace the technology. There are a lot of things coming down the pipeline that in the past, number one, were not possible or unaffordable. Now, not only is it possible, it's becoming increasingly more affordable. So Mm -hmm. question the whole um, basis of everything. Now is a good time to ask those really bizarre, do we have to do it that way Mm -hmm. question? Because more often than not with technology... The answer is you don't yeah. have to do it that way anymore. Well, I think it always comes down to, do, can you use it for good? Whether Absolutely. that's good at a societal level or good for your business, find the way that it can be used for your benefit. Or the, Again, that doesn't mean you don't think about the broader application for to sure. society and implications to society. I think like anything, you can find a good use for it. You could also find an equivalent bad use for it as well. And that comes down to how we as human beings Absolutely. want to approach that adoption of new tech. 100% agree. 100% agree. Well, John, this has been great, man. This really, is awesome. And now let's go get some food down at La Finca. But thanks for coming man Absolutely. i'm sure we'll be doing this again sometime and i look forward to seeing the evolution of the elevator club likewise thanks for having me out spencer my Appreciate pleasure it. man bye bye true captive believes in healthcare that is personal and insurance that isn't complicated check them out at truecaptive.com